Hi, everybody. Welcome to Coach Benachem Bernfeld on this beautiful Sunday night. Thank you for joining us. Tonight's shear is shear 202. And I want to first start off thanking the, the, the people for joining us every week. As you know, the platform has been growing. And we want to thank everybody for posting on the WhatsApp statuses and telling people about the program, family, friends. And I said all the time, it's a place to, to really get clarity and to really understand things. And uh, hopefully tonight, we get a lot of clarity, a lot of opinion. If anyone wants to join the WhatsApp statuses, to join the WhatsApp chats, please WhatsApp me at 732-314-1710. And we'll also send out the community chat links so everybody can join every week. Um, again, for anybody who's watching this on YouTube, you can click on the like button and uh, click on the subscribe button so Menachem posts the video every week of all the speakers. You get to see them as they come out and be part of the tremendous place over here that every week that we join and be part of all the Shiram. I want to thank all the advertising sponsors of Lakewood School here in Lakewood, Ellie and Ariel from Five Town Central, and Chayla Kaufman from JCN. Again, for anybody here the first time, every Sunday night at 9.30 on the Zoom ID, we have different topics, different programs, different speakers, different therapists, Rabbanim, the very chizik people. Next week, September 22nd, we're going to have an amazing program. Again, the world famous Mashpia speaker who's on quite a few times. Also speak from Eretz Yisrael, Rabbi Joe Rosenfeld. The topic is going to be called The Possibility of Joy, Saying Yes to Life in Spite of Everything. Imagination, Dreaming, and the Power of Optimism. It should be a very powerful program. And um, please join us. Menachem, are you doing the Gematria tonight? Sure. Okay, so now it's Shir 202, Rabbi Aaron. Every week we do a Gematria. And the Shir and the speech, uh, Menachem is going to give the Gematria tonight. Special Gematria from Aaron Noya, from Aaron Noya, going to make it tonight. So tonight, the topic, The Secret Life of God, Transforming Our perspective, Perception of the Divine and Rediscovering Your Divine Identity. So Rabbi Noyer gave me over the Vigamatria to understand that Klal Yisrael, we're all the kids of Hashem, and we're trying to get closer to Him. And 202 is Gematria, B'nai Malachim. Thank you, Rabbi Noyer. Thank you, Rabbi Noyer. Okay, Menachem, back to you. So the bottom line, we're here Sunday night. We have Rabbi Aaron, who we've been trying to get for a while on the program. Rabbi is here tonight. And what are we doing here tonight? What are we speaking about? Why are we here? Amazing. Thank you very much. Um, welcome, everyone. Another Let's Get Real with Coach Menachem. We're here in Chodesh Elul, and, uh, we're, you know, there's a lot to talk about. We're all trying to get to learn, to grow. And I, I say our program is all about panemius, sometimes panemius atayra, sometimes panemius of ourselves. And uh, to stop, for, to stop for a moment and say, wait a second, where am I? What am I doing? What am I looking for? And really tonight, I think we're going to go to very basic, basic questions and uh, the foundation where most of us are born, you know, into Jewish families, Baruch Hashem, and we're in a good place, which is amazing. The chinuch we get. Uh, but we've heard many times, sometimes you have to stop and figure out who put on my tzitzis, who put on my till, and uh, think, where am I? What am I doing? Where do I come in with all of this? Um, it's possible that many have questions, but they don't have where to turn to. And especially when it comes to questions of emuna, betachen, talking about real, real basic questions. Questions about God. Many people, they would say, you know, we don't want to go there. Let's not talk about it. I don't have the answers. What does he want from us? What does he want from me? You know, get up in the morning, what? I'm trying. We're all trying. We all want to be better. But many people, when they go to sleep, they don't feel, they feel like, am I doing the right thing or not? Am I connected? What does connection look like? And... Um, Especially when people go through tsaras, people go through looking at the world, there's a lot of negativity going on and thinking, wait a second, where's Hashem in all of this? So these are real, real questions. And I think it's, um, every person should have a safe place. You know, you don't have to walk around talking about it, but you should have a place where you can become real and say, wait a second, I've been doing this for many, many years, but what's, what's it all about? And then see what comes up. And then hopefully you have someone to talk to. And that's what we're doing tonight, the Mitzvah Shem. We have 
Rabbi Aaron with us, something that he talks about, whether it's for Balchuvas or for people who are rediscovering, relearning. So I think tonight we're going to start this conversation. And um, I think any question is valid. Bring it up. And hopefully it's going to help us, Mitzvah Shem, get into this Elul, um, close to Tashem, knowing not what He wants from us, knowing what we, what's our role. And I believe that that's really what's tshuva. You know, we all have things that we want to work on, but tshuva is, wait a second, coming back to ourselves, coming back to Hashem, coming back to the basics and seeing, okay, so now what can I be better? But if we don't have the foundation, if we're missing the foundation, then if you give us a little bit, a little shake, then we'll get lost. We're lost. So it's not an easy discussion, but uh, let's try to do it. Let's try to talk about these questions that many of us have. So thank you. We have a lot of siyat to Dishmaya. Okay, we're going to turn over in a second to Rabbi Aaron. Let me just read the, again. We'll get into it. tonight's program. It's called The Secret Life of God, Transforming Our Perception of the Divine and Rediscovering Your Divine Identity. And then anybody who doesn't know, Rabbi Aaron is a world-famous speaker. He wrote many, many books, amazing books. You can search him, his name online on Amazon. He has a website as well. Um, give me one second. I think I'll look something up. <laughs> okay, Rabbi Aaron, I'm going to read your bio, and then the floor is yours, okay? Rabbi David Aaron is a renowned spiritual leader in education with over 30 years' experience exploring profound questions about God and life. Known for his clarity and wit, he helps people rethink self-debating beliefs about themselves and Hashem, encouraging personal empowerment and deeper spiritual understanding. As a child of a Holocaust survivor, Rabbi Aaron's personal journey has shaped his compassion approach to addressing fears and doubts about faith. He's the dean and founder of Israelite and, and, and the Shivot Orot in Jerusalem, where he leads educational programs on the Jewish leadership and spiritual growth. His teaching grounded in Torah and Hasidic sources resonate with people of all backgrounds, including scholars and professors, professionals, Rabbi Aaron, has authored eight influential books, such as The Endless Light and The God-Powered Life, some of which have been translated to several languages. He lives in Jerusalem with his wife, Hannah, and seven children, Rabbi Aaron. Rabbi Aaron continues to inspire individuals worldwide through his writings and his teaching and his programs. And it's an honor to have you with us tonight, waking up so early in the morning for us. We really appreciate it. With very little sleep, Rabbi David Aaron, please open it up. Okay, well, thank you so much for inviting me. It's a real pleasure. Uh, I think I'll start with who I am and why I do what I do. Start with the why. Well, first of all, as mentioned in the bio, if somebody were to ask me, uh, who are you, Rabbi David Aaron, I would say I'm a son of a survivor. Uh, that really is the background or the core of what moves me. Uh, my mother was in the concentration camp. My mother did not speak about the concentration camp. She wanted to protect us from all that. The only problem is that she would scream about it in the middle of the night. So uh, young age, I woke up to my mother screaming, having I assumed the nightmare about the concentration camp. And I was bombarded with questions. Is there, is there Hashem? And if there is Hashem, is he good? And if he's good, why is the world so bad? And why is there so much pain and suffering? And if, and if we're the chosen people, I, I wish he chose somebody else. And so at a very young age, I was set up to be a philosopher. And uh, all the books that I've written were not in research for everybody else's questions. It's been my journey to make peace with Hashem and being a Yid and all the Ra in the world, the bad in the world. And um, so why do I do what I do? Uh, you know, Carl Jung says, I think... Only the wounded doctor can heal. I think uh, only the wounded rabbi can maybe spiritually heal. I'm, I'm a wounded child. My parents were wonderful people, but definitely I was wounded. I was beat up for being Jewish. I was, uh, I was beat up for killing Jesus. I, I told them I don't even know the kid. I never played with him, but it didn't matter. And uh, so uh, I had a lot of baggage, you know, and... Uh, I've been working on basically unpacking my baggage and going on a spiritual journey. So uh, why I do what I do, I, I teach Torah and I talk about Hashem, not because I think what I teach is true. I think what I teach is true, but I think math is true. I don't teach math. 
I teach what I teach because uh, it has helped me and I, Baruch Hashem, over many decades of doing this, it's helped a lot of other people. I think uh, Emunah can break people or make people. It depends who you are. In a certain way, I think my, my, my mission is to save people from God and return them back to Hashem. Because I think a lot of people are suffering and have what I call theophobia. They have a, a very unhealthy and not Torah-based fear of Hashem. I remember a number of years ago, uh, Rosh Chodesh Ella was Motu Shabbos, and I was in a different neighborhood. I live here in the old city of Jerusalem. I was in a different neighborhood, and we were walking out from Marav, and a guy, a stranger, turns to me and says, so now we're supposed to be scared, right? Yeah, right, we turn on scared mode. And um, for a lot of people, Elo is not uh, a comfortable time because uh, this year at Shemayim, this fear, this sense of threat. And uh, I try to, I, I, I personally believe that all our problems are rooted in our misconceptions about Hashem. And uh, I think, uh, you know, if... Um, if you were lying on the couch of Sigmund Freud, he tried to figure out your issues with sexu sexuality. And if you were lying on the on the couch of Adler, he tried to figure out what your issues are with social acceptance and relationships. I think if we're lying on the couch of Moshe Rabbeinu, he would try to help us understand what's our issues with Hashem. Because I think our issues with Hashem is really the foundation and the soul of all our issues. And if we could get back to what do you mean when you say Hashem? What do you feel when you say Hashem? What do you, so to speak, think Hashem thinks about you? I think that's where we need to begin to start to heal. So uh, that's a little bit about who I am and why I do what I do. I just want to help people. I, I think there's no better life than helping others have a better life. That's what I try to do. I rarely do it at four o'clock in the morning, but I'm happy to do it. The best time to do it. Okay, yeah. Rabbi Aaron Shkoyach for the opening. We're gonna. There's a lot of questions. Obviously, we want to ask and really understand all the comments you said. We're gonna take a poll and let's ask people some questions and then let's get into it. Okay. Here we go. So three question poll. First question: What is your concept of Hashem, the Creator of the Universe? Like from all these answers, which one would you say makes the most resonates with you? A loving and guiding presence who cares deeply for each person. B. Hashem is an all powerful force but distant and beyond human understanding. C, the creator and sustainer of the universe, but I'm unsure of his role in everyday life. Or D, I see Hashem as a judge, rewarding good and punishing for wrongdoing. Second question. What are some of the questions you have with understanding Hashem or his ways? Four, four which one of these talk to you the most? I struggle to understand how suffering fits into Hashem's plan. I want practical guidance on how to feel closer to him. I wonder about the effectiveness of my davening and if 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 and how they are answered. Or D, I find it difficult to discern what Hashem wants for me in certain situations. Third question. How do you view the concept of divine identity within yourself? Four possible answers. I'm what do you see as when you say like Hashem is part of you, you're like a reflection of Hashem? What does that mean to you? Does that mean A, I'm a reflection of Hashem's will and purpose? B, I'm on a journey to discover, or B, I'm not sure, basically, I'm on a journey to discover my divine essence. C, I struggle to connect with this idea. I really don't know what this means. Or D, godliness is in each person, and they have the ability to tap into it at any time. So when you hear this concept of every person is born with the Musa Hashem, which one of these talk to you? So these are the three questions. Let everybody answer Now, from tonight's show, we're going back to the Aleph, Aleph, right? We're doing Aleph, right? Comments Aleph, oh, that's what we're doing? That's it. Starting fresh. Starting fresh. It's a new year. we got to start fresh. Okay, we're going to end the poll, and I'm going to share the results with everybody, and then Rabbi Aaron will review it together. Is that okay? Okay, here we go. First question, what is your concept of Hashem, the creator of the universe? So 68% of the people here tonight, they view Hashem as a loving and guiding presence who cares deeply for each person. Only 17% say Hashem is an all-powerful force, but distant and beyond human understanding. Only 8% the creator is the state of the universe, but I'm unsure of his role every day. 
and only 6% see Hashem as a judge rewarding good and punishing for wrongdoing. So most people here tonight find Hashem as a, when they hear the concept of what Hashem means, to them that means a loving, guiding presence who cares deeply for each person. Want to comment on this or should we go to the next one? You want me to comment? Yeah, do you have any comment on, on this poll? Just, just... Um, I'm I'm very happy to hear that so many people have a loving, guiding presence who deeply cares about them. Uh, you know, I, I, how much do you want me to rap about that? No, you can talk now. This is this is the time you talk. Let's uh, go to the next question. Okay. You wanna, uh, results, whatever you we, want. We, you know, I, I I mentioned before that I I want to save people from God and bring them back to Hashem. Hashem, the name is Yud, then the Hey, then the Vav, and then the Hey. And um, uh, sadly, a lot of people don't know that, you know, that that name is identified with the Mida, with the attribute of Rachamim. And uh, Rachamim, although has been translated as compassion, I'm not sure that's the best translation. Rachamim is identified with the word Rechem. Rechem is a womb. We are to Hashem like a baby is to the womb of her or his mother. The baby exists within the mother. The baby is a facet of the mother. At that stage of development, the baby can't exist without the mother. The baby is the very context. The, ba- the mother is the context of the baby. In fact, the name Yud He Vav He, the Arizal says, if you double each letter, you, you know, 10 times 10, Hey, uh, five times five, Vav, six times six, hey, Vav, uh, 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 five times five, you get the gematria of Makom. Because Yud Ke Vav Ke correlates to the truth that Hashem is Makomo Olam. He is the place in the space of the universe. And he's not far somewhere over there, but we actually exist within Hashem. We are a part of Hashem, although we're not Hashem. The baby is other than the mother. And yet there's really nothing but the mother because the mother, the baby can't exist without the mother. So it's not like there's two. It's not like there's a mother and a baby. The baby doesn't have an independent existence. And yet the baby mysteriously is very other than the mother. And therefore, Rachamim is that loving energy that a mother has towards her unborn child that she loves that baby she supports that baby she accommodates that baby she's committed to the growth of that baby i think the closest word to rachamim is actually unconditional love and uh a lot of people sadly uh you don't have don't have that i i once had a fellow that did one of my seminars he had a t-shirt of a comic strip called calvin and hobbs which is a, 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 a cartoon where a little, a little boy has a conversation with his toy tiger. And Hobbes, the toy tiger, turns to Calvin and says, Calvin, do you believe in God? And he's got this philosophical look on his face with the hand behind his head. And he goes, well, somebody's out to get me. And uh, a lot of people are suffering from a God who's out to get you. And maybe God is, but Hashem is out to give you. Okay, let's go to the next. Yeah. Let's go to the next poll. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay, the second one. What are some questions you have with understanding Hashem or his ways? So 90% of the people, it's really it's pretty much split in four over here. I guess everybody's struggling with all these things. I struggle to understand how Hashem's suffering fits into how suffering fits into Hashem's plan. I want practical guidance on how to feel close to Hashem. That's 38% of the people. Most people say they want practical guidance. Rabbi Aaron, from you. How to feel closer to Hashem. 16% of the people um, wonder about the effectiveness of davening and how to actually, and if it actually works and if they're answered. And 27% of the people find it difficult to discern what Hashem wants from me, from them, in certain situations. So you want me to address all of them? I I, I don't have it in front of me, so tell me which one. Which one was the first one? Your program, whatever you wanted. The first one was the first one. I struggle to understand how suffering fits into Hashem's plan. Right. And so do I. I'm not, not so much the plan, but, you know, uh, I once heard if there is Hashem, then suffering makes no sense at all. Uh, but if there is not Hashem, then nothing makes any sense at all. And uh, suffering is a, is a big one. And yet, on the other hand, um, <clears throat> I um, 
so far, most people I meet have had transformational experiences from their suffering in life, much more than from their joyous moments in their life. It would be great if we could take our joyous moments and use them to transform ourselves. But for some reason, most people I meet have discovered so much and have grown so much through the suffering. You know, they say this guy named Audubon, who's got the Audubon Society for the Protection of uh, Preservation of Animals. They say that the beginning of his career was that he was a little boy and he saw a butterfly trying to get out of its cocoon. You know, like the caterpillar goes into a cocoon and is transformed to get out. And he saw this little, you know, newborn butterfly trying to get through this tiny little hole in the cocoon. So he wanted to help it not suffer. So he, he took a scissor and he, he opened up the hole bigger and the, and the butterfly came out, but its wings were damaged. And he realized that the way it builds its wings is through getting through that painful hole. And so uh, pain has a, a power to it. You know, my, my, my wife taught me this when she was giving birth. She was in excruciating pain and I was uh, beside myself. We went to all the courses that I was supposed to help her, you know, Lamaze, but I felt more like a Shlamaz uh, trying to help her. And she was in a tremendous pain. And uh, I started to try and help her breathe, but I started to hyperventilate. And she, um, she suddenly in the, you know, after a terrible, painful contraction, she turned to me with great calm. And she said to me, could you chill out? Could you calm down? And I was already about to get an epidural. So um, she uh, she goes back in, she gets this tremendous pain and she comes out of it again and she says, I might be in excruciating pain, but I'm not suffering. You certainly look like you are. She went back into the contraction and she came out of it and she said, suffering is pain with no purpose. This is the most purposeful pain that I could ever have dreamed of. This is power. And if a woman can say that about to give birth, to me, there's a nevua there, there's a shtickle ruach hakodesh. And I believe that uh, pain with purpose turns into power, pain without purpose turns into suffering. And um, whatever we're going through is an opportunity for growth, for self-discovery, to come closer to Hashem, uh, and what it means to come closer to Hashem is to feel closer to the very root and the very essence of the very context of all being, which is a tremendously self-expanding experience to become, to realize how, how connected I am to Hashem. You see, most people think that Hashem is someone somewhere over there who created someone somewhere over here. And he's infinite, and I'm infinitesimal. He's eternal, and I'm a passing moment. He's perfect, and I'm really imperfect. He's all-knowing, and I'm pretty stupid. That's a very harsh... I mean, who wants to hang out with a god like that, you know? Uh, I heard one, one of my students said, if God is truly... God, I can prove to you that God is not good, because just being in his presence makes me feel bad about myself. He's so, he's so great. I feel so small and so nothing. But that's because people have this image of Hashem over there who created this over here. But Hashem, as we mentioned before, Yud Kei Vav Kei, you know, just like the atheist, an atheist says, I don't believe there's a God in existence. The atheist is right. There is no God in existence. He's not over there and he's not in existence. A Kaddish Baruch Hu is existence and infinitely more than that. We're in existence. We exist within Hashem. We're a facet of Hashem. We're not Hashem. And, 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 and when we go through Yisurim, some of the greatest things our sages tell us, Chachamim tell us, we dafka accomplish through Yisurim because it's, it's all about birth. It's getting beyond your limited thinking. And that's painful because we're very often stuck. And we need to look at whatever Yisurim we're going through as a uh, labor pain, that something is about to be born here. Uh, something within me, a new idea, a new opportunity, a, 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 a new understanding, a new vision, 
But uh, why Hashem runs the world this way, that I don't know. But uh, if we look at Yisurim and give it a purpose, it turns into power and ask ourselves, what can I give birth to in this situation? Let's 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 address also what people are having a hard time. I want a practical guidance on how to feel closer to Hashem. The interesting thing is, how do we succeed in feeling far away from Hashem? Because if Hashem is someone somewhere over there, we'll never get close to him. That's not possible to get close to him because every step you take towards the infinite leaves you an infinite journey ahead of you. So it's a tremendously frustrating idea when you have an idea of Hashem over there. But if I understand that Hashem is the very context of all being and the very essence and the soul of all being, then, um, you know, for instance, the name Elohim, is Baal Kochot Kulam. He is the master and the owner of all powers. That means all the powers within you are not from you. Right this very second, there are 17 muscles in my face that have to work in perfect coordination for every syllable to come out of my mouth. Now, I don't even know how there's place in my face for 17 muscles. And honestly, I don't even know how to talk. I don't even know how to say, I don't know how to say. All the powers within me are not from me. I ask my students to do an experiment with me. If they don't mind, for the next 60 seconds, stop your heart. Turn your heart off. And then I'll let you know when you can turn it back on. Well, that's ridiculous. I can't turn my heart off and on. But if you can't turn your heart off and on at will, then you're not beating your heart. And if you're not beating your heart, who is? Whoever that is, I suggest we stay in good contact. That whoever we say Hashem. How did we stop feeling Hashem in our lives? Our lives is kihu chayenu. He is our life. And every move I make and every breath I take, he's enabling me right now. So all the powers within me are not from me. That's, that's Elohim. And Yud Kevavke, the truth is that at Sinai, Anochi Hashem Elokecha means I am all there ever was, is, and ever will be. Enod Milvado, there's only one I am. Elokecha, I am the soul of your soul. You exist within me, and I become channeled and manifest in the world through you. And that's really what it means to be an Ebed Hashem. How, how am I I'm an Ebed Hashem? I'm a channel. For Hashem's wisdom, because this is not my wisdom. I didn't teach my brain to think. And this is not my heart beat. I didn't give my heart the beat. And so, so somehow we, because I think so, we think Hashem is over there, rather everywhere. You know, I have a cute little animation about two drops having a conversation. One drop just got dropped by his girlfriend because he doesn't believe in the ocean. And his friend, who's a drop, there drops in the ocean, says, Seymour, you don't believe in the ocean? He said, well, tell me where he is and I'll believe him. He says, he's not over there. He's everywhere. We're drops within the ocean. We're a drop of the ocean. We're within him. And we're a shtickle of him. We're a little bit of him. And he says, well, that's crazy. And he says, no, there's no better, there's no greater feeling than feeling part of the greater. And so because we have put Hashem so far away, uh, and that's my issue with for most people, God is someone somewhere over there. Hashem is Enod Mavado, there's nothing but Hashem, all exists within him. All is a facet of him, and yet not him. Just like the baby is not the mother, we are zuulato, and yet we are taught efezuulato. There's nothing but him, and yet somehow Hashem created the world lativ mituvo lezuulato to give up his goodness to others. So how can there be nothing but him, and yet still be other? And the answer, in a very deep way, is we're like a baby within the womb of the mother. And so, Shivit Yashem Negdi Tamid, I place Yud Ke Vav Ke in front of me. The word Shiviti is the word to equal. And I see Hashem equally everywhere in every situation I'm in. Ke Enod Milvado, Vamale Olam Kvodo. 
His presence is everywhere. And the question is, are we opening our minds and our hearts to let that truth in? Well, these are new concepts. We will have to continue discussing it because new concepts for many. Well, let's let's go to the third poll over here. How do you view the concept of divine identity within yourself? How do you view that you're a part of God? So the first answer is I'm a reflection of Hashem's will and purpose, 30%. 26% of people, I'm on a journey to discover my divine essence. They don't know what that means. I struggle to connect with the idea of 16% of people. 45% of people, most people here view godliness is in each person and they have the ability to tap into it at any time. Beautiful. Um, well, you know, most people think that we have a neshama. We talk that way. We have a neshama and we have a goof. We, we have a soul and we have a body. It's not completely right. Uh, just like when we say myself, it sounds like you have a self, but you don't have a self. You are the self. We just speak that way, myself. You have a self. The truth is you don't have a soul. You are a soul. You have a body and you have a soul. And what is the soul? A soul is, so to speak, a little piece of Hashem. A little piece of Hashem. You, when I say you, I'm talking to the you before you got your name, before you got your body, before you were given the part you play. The essential you. You know, if a person were to close their eyes and just observe their physical sensations and say, I have physical sensations, but I'm not my physical sensations. I'm observing them. Okay, so go up the ladder. Now observe your emotions. I'm feeling happy. I'm feeling sad. I have emotions, but I'm not my emotions. I'm observing them. Okay, go up the ladder of awareness and observe your thoughts. Thousands of thoughts go across the screen of our minds. I have thoughts. I have thousands of thoughts. Many of them just drop into my head. But I'm not my thoughts. I'm observing my thoughts. If I'm not my physical sensations and I'm not my emotions and I'm not my thoughts, who am I? I am that pure awareness. I am, I, 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 I am a neshama. I am a soul. And that is, that is elokus, that is godliness. You're not Hashem, but as I mentioned in the metaphor, the Satma Rebbe uses this metaphor. The Satma Rebbe says that if Hashem were the ocean, we would be a drop in that ocean. Others use uh, a metaphor of if, if, if Hashem were the sun, we would be a ray of his light. And others uh, use the metaphor, if Hashem were white light, we'd be one of the colors in the spectrum of that white light. But you, the essential you, that I am, before you say I am David, before you say I am David, Aaron, a rabbi, that pure sense of I amness, that's, uh, that's godly. That is godly. The problem is we get lost in our emotions and we start to think we are our emotions. That's why I have something called soul pun, not old pun. I call it soul pun because I want to teach you the language of soul. And one of the languages of soul is souls don't say I am angry because then you become angry. And then to stop being angry is a bit of a survival issue. Well, well, well who will I be if I'm not angry? Well, don't say I'm angry. Say I feel angry. You might even want to look at the anger. You might even want to give it a color. You might want to give it a name, but don't become your anger. Feel your anger. Embrace your anger. Just don't get lost in your anger. Don't get controlled by your anger. Don't say, I'm depressed. Say, I feel depressed. And maybe give that depression a color or maybe give it a shape. What shape is your, get a little distance from it. I'm not saying deny you're feeling it, feel it. You know, the healing of grieving is to grieve, but don't get lost in it. Don't get controlled by it because you are a neshama. You are a soul. And uh, you're like a computer screen. Imagine a computer screen, a, a red ball rolls across the screen and the computer thinks, 
oh, I'm a red ball. But then it disappears. Hey, who am I? And then a dog comes from the left side barking and you say, oh, I guess I'm a dog. No, no, you're not a dog. You're that pure scream. And, and that's where we need to go. I think that's actually the therapy of learning Gomorrah. I think there's a tremendous awakening to ourselves as souls when you learn Gomorrah with a Chavrusa and your Chavrusa presents a pshat in the Gemara, and you thought it saw it differently and you start arguing and you start realizing that you got stuck in your pshat and you need to let go of it not identify and think I am my thoughts I am my opinions I am my my interpretations no I have inter- I'm in the shama and so something happens when you're learning to learn to observe and I think that's maybe why we're called observant Jews, you know, because we want to we want to keep that not get lost in the thoughts and the feelings and 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 be be in them, but not be controlled by them. And so that's an neshama. And as an neshama, we always feel Hashem. But we have to go to that place of nishmatiyut, that soulfulness. You know, mindfulness has become a you know a very big buzzword. Yiddishkeit was soulfulness, you know? And what is a Yehudi? The word Yehudi comes from from Lahodot, which means to acknowledge and it means to thank. A a Yid is a person who is mindful of and grateful to Hashem. And what am I mindful of and grateful to Hashem for? That ain't no Mavado. There's Mamish, nothing but Him. All exists within him, all is a facet of him, and yet not him. It's an interesting idea. Look at Adam was created B'Tselem Elohim, and yet within Adam was Chava, who was other than Adam. So within the B'Tselem Elohim is a oneness that includes otherness while staying one. And that's what Shema Yisrael is actually saying. When you say Shema Yisrael, you say Shema Yisrael, Hashem, Enod Mavado, there's nothing but Hashem. Eloheinu, he's our Hashem, so there's me and Hashem. And yet we say, Enod Mavado, there's nothing but Hashem. And again, I, I go back to the metaphor of the baby. When you're davening, you should imagine yourself, so to speak, within the womb of the divine, speaking to the divine. And where are you getting all that energy to even speak to the divine? Because because you're a little bit of the divine. These are deep, heavy ideas. For me to say it in the middle of the night is easy. But for you guys, maybe it's uh, getting late. But whatever. I I love questions. And no questions are out of bounds. Soon we'll practice it. Some practice. (laughs) Okay. Rabbi Aaron, you ready for questions? Love questions. Okay, here we go. Hold on one second. Hi, how are you? Hi, Rabbi. Shalom. Hello. Actually, oh, I read. Hi, I read... <laughs> your name is iPhone. Yeah. Okay. Shalom. Actually, I read your book, The Secret Life of God. It's an amazing book. I love right, it. So thank you. I, 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 nobody should think I set this guy up. I don't even know iPhone. <laughs> Especially the insight that you said that um, to remember, like the main path to, like, to try to entertain that new idea that Hashem is enduring pain together with us. When we are feeling pain, so is he. That was a very powerful idea. Right. But it's important that it's not a new concept. Anochi Mobit is a long time before the secret life of God. You know, David Amelach says, Gam ki mavid lo irara ki madi. Even if I'm walking through the valley of death, I will not fear evil because you are with me. The Zohar adds, adds, adds only one word of interpretation. Mamash. Really. And I, and I grew up thinking Hashem was watching us in pain. And when people would ask, where is God in the Holocaust? I, I, I didn't have the answer, but now I have the answer. He was in the gas chamber with the Yidden. Now the question is, what was he doing in there? Well, you know, I don't want to give my whole book away, you know. So uh, that's uh, the secret life of God very much. Uh, look, as a son of a survivor, if, if I could say what my mission is in life, I just want to help people suffer less and feel happier. And, uh, or I want to suffer less and feel happier too. 
And so uh, I, 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 so I appreciate your words. What's your question? Nice. So actually, it's the perfect day to discuss all of this, and especially pain, because today in Lakewood there was a very tragic levi of a mother of five kids, a young mother that tragically she collapsed and passed away, leaving a full family of kids. Very painful. Right. Um, and I think like after such a levi, everyone relatives and non-relatives and everybody that even hears tragedy in the world like when every time we hear tragedy it's caused to revamp our connection with Hashem despite so much pain and I think it's many times for myself and I think for many people it's very confusing so, so I, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up you know imagine I have a little sliver in my finger and I take a needle to pull it out if my finger had self-awareness, it would say, how could you do this to me? How could you afflict pain on me? And what would I say to my finger? The first thing I would say, wow, that's really cool. You know how to talk. But once I get over the, the shock, my finger talking to me, I would say, how could I do this to you? You're a chilek of me. You're a part of me. I'm with you in this pain. The real question is, why would Hashem allow a part of himself to go through my, so much pain. And, uh, I, you know, when I, I, before I used to think Hashem was a, a sadist. Now my question is, is he a masochist? But he's not a masochist. I think uh, Hashem, uh, this is way too deep right now to go into, but, um, but it's important to know that Hashem is mamish with us. And I had a fellow who did my program who was the son of two survivors. And, uh, and he lived and breathed the Holocaust. I, 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 I'm not there. I have one survivor. And um, he was very angry, very angry at God, very angry at Yiddishkeit. Um, and he came to my seminar because he wanted to learn. It was a three-week seminar. It was during Tisha B'Av. That seminar happened to happen during the three weeks. And uh, I gave a shiur on the rooftop of, uh, of uh, our yeshiva, Raita which overlooks the, the, the Western Wall, the, the, the Kotel. And I gave a shir about how Hashem, Anochim of Tzara, I am with you in your pain. And, and the idea of Hashem, as, uh, the Piazetz, the Rebbe talking about Hashem, is an endless pain. And, and, and the idea of Hashem crying. And this fellow came up to me and said, I've been waiting for someone to tell me that God is with us in our pain and is crying. I can only believe in a God who's crying. And that was a transformation for him. So, um, so when we have this, you know, this resentment that Hashem is watching all this above in his ivory tower and, uh, and we're in pain and, and he's told us, but it's all good for you. Don't worry. It's all good for you. You know, but, but, what, but, but we need to, uh, we need to shift that. Hashem is with us in the pain, the tsar of the shechina, Hashem, the Shekhinah is by the head of the person who is in pain and says, my limbs are hurting me. You know, we, we, it's, a, it's, a, it's a serious paradigm shift in how we understand Hashem. And, uh, you know, again, I don't want to get into it right now because it's bummish. some questions get an answer, some questions get a class, and some questions get a book, uh, which my book is a course that I give. So, uh, but it's important to understand that, when you have joy in your life and you share it with somebody, it's doubled. And when you have pain in your life and you share it with somebody or someone shares it with you, it's halved. All the more so to know that Hashem shares in our pain. And he's not just watching us and saying, yeah, it'll be good for you. Don't worry. Uh, trust me. I'm with you. I'm mamish with you in your pain. Uh, and I have, a, I have a great plan and just... Just be patient with me. So uh, that's what I. Th that's how, how how I look at it. Yes, I hear all of that, and it's amazing. And I mean, we need to implement that. But my, like, I want to add to what I asked, and that is that when with people, like if somebody conducts himself in an evil way towards you, like I think the natural human reaction to, to survive is to just run from that person not to communicate and just cut off ties with them. 
Yet when it comes to Hashem, like we believe that every aspect and occurrence in our life is divinely orchestrated, which means that he, he is behind all the evil too. And still, we must believe that everything is good and even more to trust him and just feel comforted. So I guess my question is, like this seems, this these two ideas seem contradictory to our human experience in the world. Like we can't, we can't flight him. <laughs> that would be a bad idea. We can't flight from Hashem. So I guess like the question is, how do we flight to him and find comfort in him? Knowing that he is behind everything, behind evil, behind pain, behind suffering. Right. So, called Avid Rahmana, Latav Avid, everything that Hashem does, Rahmana, the compassionate one, does in our best interest. Sometimes that best interest could take a couple of Gilgulim, a couple of, uh, you know, cycles in this world to, to know what it is. And uh, if something's happening, then to find the, the, the spark of holiness there is to always ask us, not, not, not ask why is this happening to me, because I've not met anybody that got that answer. But now that this is happening to me, what is this happening asking from me? And always look at everything as an opportunity to grow, to get beyond my, my, my little self to more, a more expanded sense of self. And uh, and give pain purpose, and that turns it into power. And so, um, you know, there's Bechira. A person has free choice. But nonetheless, it's true that if Hashem allows this person to, to act out that bad choice and I become subject to it, there must be purpose to this. There must be meaning to all this. And to try and find where can and how can I grow from what I'm doing here and become and, and find that birthing pain that enables me to reach a higher level of consciousness? Just, I just want to add to what you're saying. Many times people go through challenges. It, it is sometimes a process to get to this stage, what we're discussing tonight, to the you know, the expand to the idea. Sometimes people are in pain and they don't want to hear this. They just don't want to hear this. <laughs> like they're, they're really hurting. So to understand that it, you, not always do you get to this space. I'm looking the godless to understand this ideas right away. And that's okay. And uh, eventually you come back to the program, you listen to it, you know. And uh, while you're on this process, you know, being in that situation, many times we, like the idea we're going to be discussing a lot tonight, we don't always understand. But you mentioned many times, everything is good. Hashem is Rachman, Kalman Dov, Rachman, the Tav. So these are all logic. And eventually we're working on to connect to Hashem, to have that image. For many people, we have to re relearn that image, to understand that Hashem is only Rahman and he's there and he understands and we're part of it and he only wants good, but it could take time to understand it. Sure. You know, when, 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 when your child scrapes his knee and he comes in crying, you don't give him the secret life of God to read. That's you know, it. right now he's in pain and you validate that pain and you say, oy, 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 really, oy, oy, oy. And you share that pain with him. And, and sometimes that's the healing. And so there's a difference between philosophy and psychology. And so, um, and there's a time for that. When a person's crying, you, you don't give them answers. They're not, they don't even want answers. Right now, they, 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 they deserve to feel their question and, and feel their pain. And we don't want to rob them of that because there's a tremendous amount of growth in that pain. So, um, you know, um, I, I actually heard this from uh, Rabbi uh, Dr. David Gottlieb. He gave a shiur on faith after the Holocaust. And at the end of the shiur, a man got up with a very thick Yiddish accent and said, Rabbi, 
I cannot accept anything that you said. I am a survivor of the Holocaust and nothing you said makes any sense. So Rabbi Gottlieb said, can you please share with me three points that I made? And he wasn't able to share not even one point. And he said, I want you to understand, I'm a philosopher. You came to a class on philosophy. You know, you 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 need someone that's more more a therapist, you know, because there's a time where a person is ready and able to get answers. And there's a time where a person needs to move through their pain through being validated. So it's, you know, you got to know your timing. Yeah, and, that's um, important. And, and people should know that people should know that it's OK to, you know, be there for yourself. You know, and it hurts. You don't want to hit answers. It's okay. <laughs> and I also think that, it, I, I, you know, when a person feels angry at Hashem, it's a normal that you would feel angry at Hashem because you don't understand what's going on, you know? And 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 I think the way to, to get f- through that is to not fight it. Just say, I know I don't understand Hashem. I'm feeling anger. I'm not my anger, and I'm going to move through that. But Tov Hashem l'kol ma'asav. We say this every day. Hashem is good to all, and His unconditional love is towards everyone. And that is our mantra. That needs to be our affirmation. Um, and uh, and we wait because Hashem is a Tov Muchlat. Quite frankly, I think probably the word God came from the word good. And God should be understood as the personification of all good. But for a lot of people, God is the personification of a lot of control and, and oppression and suffering. And, and, uh, and that's why I'd rather transition people to talk about Rahmana. Hashem is Rahmana. Uh, but thank you so much. I appreciate you, um, you asking that because these are the most important questions we need to be asking. And, and a, a life quest starts with a life question. Okay, Rabbi Aaron, you ready for the next question? Hi. Okay. You're on, hi. Me, hi. Thank you for taking my question. Do you, you have it? No, no, read the question. Oh, my question was, how can I be happy during the Chagim if one of my adult children who is married will not come because their spouse doesn't want to. So if Hashem loves me, I'm his daughter, why am I having this suffering? Um, I know you're not supposed to look at other people, oh, their kid came, their kid came, you know, that's that's not good. But why is is this my, my question is, okay, is it the Chira from them? Is it Yadia? Is it the fact that this is maybe another Gilgul, is it a Kapara, is it a Tikkun, is this my tough kid? I don't know why I'm in a situation where I raise my kids who are not petting, you know, good kids, excellent, but, you know, a few spouses don't, they don't want to be in my house, but they hope I have to accept it. I, I don't know why why I'm in this situation. Is this what well, did I'm... you ask your, your child's spouse how much I, money they want? <laughs> I don't I don't know with the rebellion I have everybody's got a say, price. <laughs> say I should be Mabater and no Mahloke. Run for I've listened to enough right. Torah anytime. Um Shiorim on my commute back and forth every day for years. Mavater and that you will win with Mavater and always um, no Mahloke, just run from it because I don't want to any kind of bad feelings. So I'm in, this is my Matzav and it's, my heart is broken, but I am obviously trying to be Basimcha with other things. <laughs> right. Well, first of all, it's totally understandable, you know, that your heart is broken and I'm sorry to hear this. Um, and all again, the why I I I don't I don't have whys. You know, uh, often people ask me questions that are very flattering because they must think I'm Mashiach. 
uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm not, um, you know, I'm a Cohen, so I don't even have a chance, but, um, but it's not about a why, you know, the, the, the entire story of the universe is one big story called the Hafta Larecha Kamocha, Zeklal Gadol B'Torah. The Torah is the story of life, all of life. It's not just simply something that happened. The stories in the Torah are stories that are happening. They're always happening. It's, it's the paradigm of all of history. And the paradigm of all of history is a hafta l'recha kamocha. And every single one of us is an episode in that great story called a hafta l'recha kamocha. And the question is, what is the a hafta l'recha kamocha choice in this situation? And I, I don't know. I can't give an adult child musr. You know, I, I, you can't give a 30-something-year-old musr. So I, I I'm just, not sure that's the answer. I don't know what the answer is because I don't I'm know. Just keeping I don't nice. know your child, and I don't know their spouse, so I can't. I can't. Uh, I, I offer an answer more specifically than every situation we're in is an opportunity for a choice of love, and you turn to Hashem as Rachmana, and you say, Hashem, you are Rachmana, you are Rachamim, you are unconditional love. Give me an answer. I need to know, Rachmana. I need to, I, what's the loving choice here? Is it loving myself here? Is it loving my son unconditionally? Because even though he married someone that I, I'm not so crazy about, is it maybe sending an invitation to his spouse? Can we have a conversation? Because I, I don't know what it is because I would need to know more details of who this is. But I, I do know that wherever we are in whatever situation we're in, it always boils down to an ahafta l'recha kamocha choice. Uh, I, oh, by the way, it's important to remember that the end of the pasuk is ani Hashem, I am Hashem. You know, and the foundation of ahafta l'recha kamocha is I am Hashem means I am all there ever is, was, and ever will be. And therefore, all of us are part of that great anochi. And is this a moment to love Hashem? Is this a moment to love myself? Is this a moment to love my, my son or to accept who he married? I don't know. But it always goes back to every situation is a variation in the Ahavdil Recha Kamocha ultimate choice. And uh, so how to stay happy? Well, love yourself and let go, you know, because... Uh, Thinking about this is probably bringing a lot of service to you and trying to figure out why they don't want to come and what did I do wrong? And maybe he didn't do anything wrong, you know? And so we, you know, I think it's the Kotzka Rebbe said that our problem isn't what others think about us. And our problem isn't even what we think about ourselves. Our problem is what we think others think about us and we mummish have no idea what others are thinking about us. And that's really a problem. So we don't even know. And I think a lot of it's services we're projecting that they don't like me or whatever. We don't know. We, we don't know what it is. And um, and there's a lot of different uh, ways of looking at this and without knowing who this is and what the dynamics no, are. They don't like me. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe that because I can. Uh, there's no reason not to like you. Why shouldn't they like you? So you know, sometimes they don't like themselves, and they're projecting what they don't like about themselves. Call it posel, Whatever somebody is seeing negative in somebody else is oft, often because they're mirroring something they're struggling with. I, I don't know. I, I, re I really don't I know. Really don't. But uh, but to say they don't like me, I can tell you that that based on that comment, then, then certainly one half to the Kamocha choice here, here is to love yourself enough to say that if they don't like me, they're wrong. <laughs> and I have to help them understand why they're wrong. So uh, anyways. I, I, I don't think so. they want to commute. They don't want to. Okay, Rabbi, Rabbi, let's go to the next question, okay? Um, you're on. Okay, hi. Uh, so I grew up um, hearing a lot about Ganaidim and Gehenim, and I'd like to know when I could, I'm, I'm actually confused, when can I allow myself to experience Hashem's love unconditionally without judgment and fear? 
just um, like when do I need to know about the when do it need to uh, when do I need to be fearful about it? Like it's a lot of confusion going on. Yeah, Gehenna is a, a very easy card to draw when you're trying to get somebody to do what you want. Um, mm -hmm. um, you know, the scare tactics um, has got to stop. This is not the way to educate people, Not certainly not in this generation. Right, but we see it in sperm, so where does it come in? When do I need to learn about it? Okay, well, it's important to understand the Rambam says that the way a person gets to Yira is he contemplates, she contemplates the wonders of creation and a love erupts within them to want to know who created this vast, incredible universe. But then they're overwhelmed with a sense of Yira. They're taken aback because they realize in the presence of such greatness, they are aware of that I'm not that great. You know, like imagine someone who's an aspiring musician and in walks the greatest guitar player in the world and starts playing the most amazing music on one hand, you love it. On the other hand, you're, you're taken aback because you feel so small in their presence, but you don't feel bad about that. You like being in the presence of such greatness. You want to be part of that. That, the Rambam says, is the foundation of Yira. But there is a pachat that comes because... Who am I in the presence of this great person? But a lot of people have been left with the pacha rather than the backdrop of the adoration and the enthusiasm, you know, of the greatness, the godless of a Kaddish Baruch Hu. Gehenna is not a place that you go, but a realization that you get that when you leave your body, you realize that you had misidentified yourself. You're in a Shema. And Enod Milvado, there's nothing but a Kaddish Baruch when you exist within him and you're a part of him. You're not him, but you're one with him. But you were thinking, speaking, and acting in ways as if you were not one with him. And when that truth becomes manifest, this burning shame of how I betrayed myself is very painful. But that, but but we transition out of it. You know, the beginning is a shock and we start to, you know, re reorient ourselves to the greatness of God. Of Baruch Hu. Our understanding of Gehenna is you don't have it forever. You don't kill Gehenna forever. It's a transition to an awakening of who I really am. And I kind of forgot who I am. Um, but um, but all this is still nested within the womb of the Ein Sof, of the oneness. And they then that love that is there. And it's and it's only coming, you know, the Reb Tzadik, Lublena Rebbe says, Hashem never wants to hurt you. He only wants to heal you. And sometimes True, but sometimes hurts. the healing is suffering because of the sin that we had done. And this I wanna I, I wanna take out but, of me because I'm really Oh well, yeah, you gotta get rid of this because we do not and my question is even if you could get rid if this was childhood, basically the school and everywhere, I wonder um if as an adult I could get clean of it. Like I really I work hard. I, I I'm not gonna tell you this is easy because there's a recording when we're children and when whoever records got the mic and they start recording on it. It's, it's pretty much in there and we have to record over it, you know, and we have to start telling ourselves, you know, positive things. Hashem is not against me. Hashem is on my side. Hashem is interested in me and cares about me. And if I have to face a, an onish, an onish has been translated as a punishment. But it's really in its essence a tiku and it's a fixing. And uh, and that's like going to a doctor and and he diagnoses a person because they'd been eating in a in a very uh, you know irresponsible way and the doctor says well you know you now have a liver problem I said I'm sorry doc don't punish me I I, I you know I'll, I'll you know like I'm not punishing you. I, we we need to heal. We need to fix. We 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 need to, but um, but I'm sorry that that's deep inside your 
you know, your childhood image of Hashem. You know, we, we, we're into Avinu Malkeinu. That comes up a lot, Rosh Hashanah. Avinu Malkeinu, Avinu Malkeinu. But people don't realize they're more into the Malkeinu than the Avinu. The Avinu part kind of got like, you know, Avinu Malkeinu means my father's the king. This is great news. This is my father's the king. I've got Schlepp over here. I've got Patexi over here. You know, I've I've uh, Ava Rachamim. I have an Av that's a Rachman, and he's the king, and that's who's judging me. But I, I, you know, I, I see Rosh Hashanah as a day of evaluation. I, I kind of meet with the boss, and the boss says, "Let's take a look at your performance. Let's let's think about what we need to do to help you. You know, get get your goals. Hit 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 your you know your goals for next year." It's not like I want to hurt you. I want to help you. Uh, we we literally have some serious paradigm shifting to do because, of, yeah. as I mentioned before, our faith can make or break your life. And a lot of people have an amuna that is breaking them. And if your amuna is making you miserable, then I think you've got the wrong God. It's mm-hmm. not the, It's not a shem from the Torah. So all these nice things I have in my mind, but I, I, it's, it's just voices coming and going, like confusing me more. I, I, what I, I have the good voices too, which are in conflict with the bad voices. What I wish is the experience, Hashem just loving without judgment. So. No, 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 no. I, I want to make very clear. Love also includes judgment. The people you love the most, you judge the most because you care about them and you want to help them. If I see a stranger on the street, son with ice cream all over his face, I'm not going to come up to him and say, hey, kid, get your face. I, he's not my kid. You know, the, the people that we love the most are the people that we judge the most. But it's not a judgment from a place of I want to hurt you. It's not a judgment that should be communicated. I'm disappointed in you and I'm angry at you. But I care about you. I love you, and I want to. I want to help you. You know the the Hebrew word for rebuke is tochacha. Tochacha comes from the word lochiach to prove, and even in English, uh, rebuke is called reprove. I'm continually proving to you how much I care about you, and that's why I'm letting you know this. You know, mm-hmm. people you don't care about, you know, you know, you don't let them know. What, where, what they need to fix, sadly, and maybe we should, but we should care, we should care about everybody, but uh, we have to reframe that judgment is a facet of Ahava. Even in the Shema, Shema Yisrael Hashem, Yud Kei Vav Kei Rachamim, Eloheinu, our judge, is Hashem Echad, is the unconditional loving one. The Eloheinu is sandwiched between two names of Rachamim. Because it's a facet of Rachamim. It only has validity within the context of Rachamim. You know, and Rachamim means I'm committed to your growth and I love you. And I, you know, I, I would rather, I, I, I think that a better word in, you know, our problem is we've been translating Yiddishkeit into English and, and, and we're losing the original feel of it. I'm not even sure that the name Elohim should be described as judge. I'd rather use the word coach. He's my coach. Because, you know, if, if, if you're being, um, being uh, trained for the Olympics, your coach is going to be rough on you. Your coach is going to say, do it again. Jump a hundred times. And, and, and you don't think your coach doesn't like you. You know your coach loves you so much that he's preparing you for the Olympics. And when a person's going through pain, I always say, well, you've just been selected to be in the Soul Olympics. Hashem is readying you for a gold medal. He wants the best for you. And, you know, um, you know, it's so interesting. Uh, I, I heard this comedian say that he wanted to get into shape, so he joined the gym. But he stopped because they kept asking him to pick up heavy things. You know what I mean? That's why you go to a gym, to pick up heavy things. People think this is an amusement park. That's what makes this so confusing. This is not an amusement park. This is a gym. We came to this world to work out. And we're here to build. Build muscles, but not necessarily physical muscles. We're here to build character. And to build character, there's a lot of work. And your coach, 
Hashem is a loving coach. And when you go through difficult times, he's on your side. He's invested in you. He's, he's training you for greatness. But he's always on your side. And, and if he's giving you this test, this Yisurim, he believes in you. You, 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 you. You're on your way to greatness. So you have to reframe all this. And you're going to have that young voice inside you that's going to repeat all the stuff you heard before. Uh, and you need to talk over it. You have to talk yourself out of it. You know, even David Melech in Tehillim Chavzayin is talking to himself. Who's he talking to? You know, the David. Hashem Uri Vishi. Mimira. From who should I be afraid? So, so why didn't he say Hashem Uri Vishi? Lo Yira. I will not fear. Why does he ask a rhetorical question? I think he's psyching himself up. I think he's talking to himself because in the second part of the Tehillim, he then turns to Hashem and sounds very different. Hashem, don't abandon me. Wait a second, David Abel, you just said Hashem is my light. Hashem is my is my is my savior. Hashem is my bastion. And, and then you turn to Hashem in 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 a, in a bit of a you know uh not I wouldn't use the word, I don't want to use the word panic, but David Amelik turns to Hashem, don't don't abandon me. What happened? David Amelik is struggling. And you first talk to yourself before you talk to Hashem. And I believe that David Amelik was talking to himself and kind of, so to speak, psyching himself up, reminding himself. But so much of what we need to do is talk to ourselves before we talk to Hashem and tell ourselves, I'm not a bad person. I don't have bad intentions. I am a child of a Kodesh Baruch Hu. He's a vinu malkeinu. He's on my side. And you got you to gotta talk to yourself. A lot of work. Somebody who grows up with those concepts and we need a reframing. Many times you need help. You know, oh, speak yeah. to someone. Someone who can sit there not uh, once in a while. It's constant. The change. You know, I, I, I have a belief that most of us have created a shem in the image of our parents. Because the first God in your life are your parents. They created you from your perspective. They created the house you're in. They set down the rules. They administer those rules. And, uh, and my experience is that uh, it's not uncommon that people who, who were, were raised by parents that are very judgmental and very critical and, 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 and very... Um, uh, very much undermining the child's power, you know, disempowering. We seem to, we go in two directions. We can either create a Shem in the image opposite of our parents, or we create a Shem in the image of our parents. But what am I supposed to do? The first, so to speak, authority of my life are my parents, and I tend to assume that all authorities and the grand authority is just like them. And it, it could take therapy to just kind of transition out of, out of a take a have a create a new map they understand that you know it's like i i i, I you know one of my hobbies is matchmaking just a hobby uh and uh i like to wreck people's lives i'm just joking but it's you know i have a hobby i'm pretty good at this but i meet people that you know they their 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 image of men is their father and if they don't have such a great you know, feeling about their father, they kind of project that and think that all men are this way. Or men have an issue with their mother and they assume that all women are this way. I, I did a shidduch for a guy and uh, and after the shidduch, he said to me, she's as crazy as every other woman in this world. <laughs> Don't even go out. <laughs> every, other, every woman in the world is crazy. So you've already judged all the women in the world. You know, and my guess is mom, maybe his mother was crazy and he's just assuming or his sisters were crazy, but he's, he's, he's stuck. And, and sometimes it's more than hearing a shiur. You know, you, you need to talk to somebody and rewire. There's a lot of stuff that's been hardwired into us as a child. It's not easy to get rid of. Wow. But it can be. Yeah. And, and it's, it's, it's important for those who need it. And I think we all need to a certain, to a certain extent the idea of Hashem is... You know, the way he loves us, our relationship, just to connect with Hashem needs some uh, education and for some healing. So here's a question yeah. that 
Yeah. I have a friend who's going through terrible service, terrible, terrible service. One of the most painful stories I've heard in my life. So I said to my friend, listen, these are your choices. You can either choose to believe that there, that there is no master to the universe and that, that this is all just one big bang and no meaning, no purpose. When you think that thought, how does that make you feel? He said, horrible. I mean, helpless and hopeless. I said, okay. Look, you could choose to believe that Hashem created the world, but got tired of it and left it. And now we're on a, a, a plane without a pilot. When you think that thought, what, how does that make you feel? It says, I feel, I feel terrified. I said, okay. Look, you could choose to believe that Hashem created this world, created you, hates your guts, loves to torture you. When you think that thought, how does that make you feel? He said, oh my gosh, that's overwhelming. I, would, I, I wouldn't be able to even get out of bed. I said, okay. So all you could choose that Hashem is a mastermind, has a plan, loves you, is on your side. And somehow, someday, this will all make sense. How does that make you feel when you think that thought? So it gives me hope. I said, I'm not proving there's a God. I'm just proving that you have to choose your beliefs. So why not choose a belief that will get you out of bed and help you cope with what you're going through? Wow. You're right, Aaron. Let's go to the next question. You're on. Okay, thank you. Um, a lot of times after work, um, I come home and my mood goes down, my motivation level goes down, and I have what to do. But I mean, I also I have family around. I have what to do, but I'm just like my motivation is down there, and like, how can I? I'm I'm very into mindfulness and, and therapy, but how can I like tap into mindfulness and tap into like the moment and realize that that this moment is from Hashem, and like it's for me to seize, to use, and to um do things with it, and to and to, and to have purpose with. How can I? How can I like? Have myself like on fire, so to speak. I'm like my my mood is like meh, like down there. Like I know I have it in me to do things and to do things well. I'm just like not motivated. I'm just um I'm not not depressed. Just I don't know apathetic. I'm not sure what the word is. Well, like how do I infuse the god godliness into the moment? and realize that um this is no one from Hashem. Like it's Hashem gave me this task to do, this chore to do, and like, and imbue and mindfulness into it and put myself, so to speak, on fire again. Wow. So uh, it's important to understand that sometimes it's not the situation, it's our mindset. You know, if you, if you paint on something that's rusted, the paint's not going to stick because the basis is missing. And sometimes we're looking for a, 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 an answer to a specific situation when actually the, 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 the backdrop, the canvas that I'm painting on, is, is the, that's what I have to deal with. And, and I think what we need to do sometimes is break our state of mind, which doesn't seem to have anything to do with, with the situation, but I can't deal with the situation because I'm already in a state of mind that's stressed or sad or whatever it is. And I believe, you know, Rabbi Nachman says, you know, sometimes you even have to do a milta dishduta. You have to do something kind of crazy to break your state. And you might want to try going into your room, closing the door, you know, and, and, and maybe putting on earphones and put on some really great happy music and just, dance because our body is holding in a lot of this stuff and if we change our movements and just infuse ourselves with some really happy music we'll just break our state and then that'll give us the ability to maybe address the situation but one would think what is going into my room and closing myself off and putting headphones on and putting on some really great music and wildly dancing quietly, you know, privately in my room, how's that going to help? My kid is screaming out there, you know, and no, you got to get into a better state of mind. And again, as I mentioned, you could have a, 
a, a rusted panel of, uh, uh, and, and you're trying to paint on it, but it won't stick because they got to go to the basis. And um, so um, try that, you know, try that. Okay, thank you. That was very helpful. Does that makes sense. I, yeah. I, it might take courage, but you, you need to break your state. You'll be surprised. Uh, you know, they, by the way, they've, they've, they've already proven that regular exercise is better than medication for depression. You know, so if a person gets those endorphins going and just dance for a while and just let go and thank Hashem. You know, when 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 I when I exercise, I thank Hashem for every part of my body. I I I think I just think of thank you. I I think thank you for my toes, thank you for my my fingers. That, and you know, we have we have so much to be thankful for. When's the last time you thanked Hashem for your left earlobe? You know, like well, I don't know. Well, we're not, I didn't even notice it. You know, like we got so much going for ourselves. It's hard to, to keep two emotions going at the same time. And so if you just try to focus on gratefulness, I know people are into mindfulness, but I don't think it's enough. I think it has to be gratefulness. You know, it's as a gratefulness. When I walk down the street, I, I just practice gratefulness. See how long you can say thank you to Hashem. Walk down the street and thank Hashem for that bird and thank Hashem for that stop sign and thank Hashem and just like go into gratefulness. My, you know, but mindfulness is a little part of it. You know, I'm not against mindfulness. Yeah. Mindfulness needs to generate gratefulness. If I'm mindful of things that I, I never saw before, I never felt before, and then I take it to gratefulness, that's, that's the path of the Yehudi. Yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Sure. Thank you. So much. Hey, Rabbi, let's go to the next question. You're on. Hi, Rabbi. Um, this is pretty crazy. If you would have told me like a year ago that I'd be talking to, I mean, I, I got into your books like about a year ago and now past the secret life of God. I'm looking forward to the next couple. Um, my, my question actually kind of relates to, to uh, the previous, and that is I've been trying to implement more and more every day, um, inviting Hashem into my life, um, in, into even the, the smallest of actions. And I, you know, I, my practice now is I, I take a breath and I say, Hashem, use me, use me as a vessel. Uh, you know, I remember that being written towards the end of Secret Life of God. And, you know, I find it so, so freeing to just be able to surrender and let Hashem work through me in, you know, difficult situations, even in small, you know, the small details of the day. I just want to know uh, from Rebbe's perspective if there's, you know, just to speak more on it, expand upon it, how I can implement this more and more, um, how to kind of strengthen that muscle, if you will. And uh, yeah. Well, first of all, what's your name? Now, now that you, yeah, now sorry. That you took off the Hester um, Yeah, Hanani Vogel. Hanani Vogel. Pleasure to meet you, Rebbe. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Um, it goes back to talking to ourselves. We need to talk to ourselves more than we listen to ourselves. Because the, when we listen to ourselves, there's this old chatter going on that's very upsetting and old and, and passe and somebody else is recording and it's not, it's not, I have to talk a self-compassionate talk. And, uh, and, and it, you know, I, I, I did mention in my book to have a prayer, Hashem, please use me. I want to be in service. I want to be a kli. I want to be a vessel. I want to be a tool. I believe in the Kabbalah, they say there's something called Shvira Sekelim, that Hashem gave light to the Kalim, and they broke. These vessels broke. I think the reasons why the vessels broke is they were Kalim, and Kalim can be just can be translated as a container, or Kalim can be just translated into an instrument or a tool. And they made mm -hmm. a mistake, and they thought they were a container, and they thought their job was to hold the light rather than to receive the light and share the light as a tool, an instrument. What instrument am I? You know, I'm a, I'm a speaker. So I'm a speaker, you know, and I want, I want the voice of compassion to come through me. I want the voice of love to come through me. I want the voice of peace to come through me. And I want Hashem to use me. And I often feel that this is not me speaking because I don't know how to speak. I don't know. I don't know how to do anything. What do I know how to do? It's, the only thing I do is I choose. I choose to put myself and place myself in service to be a kli, a tool, an instrument for Hashem's love to come into the world, for Hashem's 
peace to come into Hashem's wisdom. This is not my wisdom. All those books I wrote, I didn't write. Well, I know how to write. Well, what do I know? You know, and, and it's an incredibly beautiful feeling when you feel, uh, you know, the name Elohim, as I mentioned before, is Bal Kuchot Kulam. The experience of Elohim is to feel possessed. Hashem, I feel possessed when I speak. I feel a spirit in, in, in you know, enters in me and it's like a ruach. It's a, it's a, it, I feel like a sail that a, a ruach kodesh, a holy, a holy wind captures me and I, and I just, it just comes through and you're just like, whoa, thank you, Baruch Hashem. I just got to get out of the way, get my ego out of the way. And I just, you know, and so you always ask yourself, how can I serve? What is the avoda here? You know, what is the avoda here? And it all starts with asking the right questions. You know, Hashem, you are love almighty. I love almighty, Kodesh Baruch Hu. Rahmana, what's the loving answer in this situation? Where's the love here? You know, and again, I believe everybody's life is an episode in the grand story of Ahav Delorecha Kamocha Ani Hashem. And always look for the loving choice, but it's always be a hero of love. Well, thank you for that uh, uh, the little PR there of the God powered life. <laughs> love is always the answer, right? Yeah. I, uh, yeah, but trying no, to just but work it's with... important to know that love is all the answer, and sometimes love leads you to war because in for the love of mankind, we need to eliminate evil people. Sadly, we wish we they would do chuva. And so people sometimes think that love and judgment are are not one. Judgment is a facet of love. When I love somebody, there's also going to be a judgment there, but that judgment is in the interest of nurturing them to help them reach their greatest self. Amazing. Here's a question. Uh, I really recommend it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, question goes like this. At the end of the day, um, the feeling that I get is it's all about following the law. I don't feel I'm doing my best following the law. I don't think it's possible to be perfect. So my question is, number one, what kind of relationship is this? that, you know, I'm not doing what Hashem wants. And what do I do now that all it does, it makes me feel guilty. Right. Again, as I mentioned before, our problem is we're speaking about Yiddishkeit and English. And it comes with its own baggage. And we need to kind of go back to the Hebrew. And so, so th there is no such thing as law. There's something called halacha. Halacha literally means a path. Who wouldn't want to have a path? Give me a path. Show me my way. Give me, g let me know how to go, where I need to. I get, it's a map, you know? The problem is that I don't know where I'm going. So if you give a person a map and you don't tell them where this map can help you get to, so this map is a burden. It's, it's also mebalbel. It, it confuses me. There's just so many roots here. No, there are all these roots here and all these pathways here because it's, 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 it's going to help you get somewhere. The problem is most people don't know where it's going to help me get to. And I've, uh, <coughs> I've been surprised. I've asked educators, if, if, if Yiddishkeit were a company, it's not, of course, then what would its mission statement be? What is the mission? You know, every company has a mission statement. They'll spend tremendous amount of time and money to identify their mission because the mission is the North Star and the com compass. And every decision one makes in the company always has to align with how does this get us closer to the mission? And I've asked Mechadchim, what is the mission of, of, of a Torah life? One guy said to fear Hashem. He said, that's it? Hashem just created us so we should live in fear of him? He said, yeah, yeah, that's a fear Hashem. Another one told me, and he was in Kirov, that the mission of Yiddishkeit is to make Hashem happy. Hashem's not happy. I have to give up a double cheeseburger that I could get at running, you know, at McDonald's for $1.99. I'm Jewish. Come on, in a little compassion here. I want a cheap burger. Uh, that makes Hashem happy. Hashem's not happy. He needs me to make him happy. But if that's what he believes and he teaches Yiddishkeit, it, 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 from that point of view, that all this is to make him happy. I'm supposed to be miserable to make him happy. 
And I'm amazed that people don't know that the mission statement is something we say repeatedly every day. Asher kidishanu b'mitzvotav. You have made us holy through your mitzvot. And that the goal is to be whole. But holy was spelt wrong. It's not H-O-L-Y. It's W-H-O-L-L-Y. That's what Kadosh Shlemus of the Zohar says. It's to become a whole person. Who doesn't want to become a whole person? But when I have these laws, and I have no clue that these are actually paths, and I don't know where they're leading me to, it's very hard to be motivated by that. It just seems to be this is all about control, and it seems to be all about appeasing him and 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 keeping him happy so he doesn't make me miserable. And it's all it's a it's it's a bad framing, and it gets in our way. But imagine a guy goes to a concert and he sees this guy playing jazz, and he says, "Whoa, that's amazing! I want to be spontaneous and flowing like that guy." So he comes up and says, hey, I want to I want to learn how to play jazz like you. He says, well, I can tell you exactly where to go. There's a school in Kentucky. It's the jazz school of the world. That's where I went. This is how I learned to do this. And he says, wow, he gets into the school. And the first two months is he's learning the history of the guitar. The history of the guitar. I don't want to know the history of the guitar. I want to play like that guy. Okay, now they start giving him exercises. And his fingers are bleeding from these exercises. And there's all these rules and regulations that he has to follow in order to be a jazz player. And he's just really upset a whole year. And he's not doing what this guy did. And he goes back to this guy and says, you fooled me. That place is just about, a lo- about laws and restrictions and regulations. I want to be able to do what you do. He said, no, that, that, that was all about discipline. Mastery. There are laws to reaching excellence and and they're not to get in your way they're they're there to carve you away so it it all depends on your mindset and so but so it's hard to get motivated if my motivation is this is really all so that i show that i'm afraid of him he wants me to be afraid of him so it's hard to embrace that you know it's interesting the shema Starts off with the Haftar Shem Lokecha, and then only the next paragraph we start talking about Bahayim Shmo. And then, if you listen to my mitzvahs, why does it start with the mitzvahs? One of my teachers said, "You know, if if you don't love somebody and they ask you to do something, it's so hard to do. Even though it's the, even if it's what they ask me to do is easy, because they don't like you. So even if he asks me to do something easy, it's hard for me to do." But if you love somebody, even if they ask you to do something difficult, it's easy because I love you. Problem is, as I mentioned before, the Rambam says that the, 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 the preparation to getting to Yira was Ava. A person looks and he contemplates the wonders of creation and he feels overwhelmed by this Ava and this desire to come close. But then he realizes, oh my gosh, that greatness has another side to it, which is like, I'm overwhelmed. My ego shrinks uh, who am I in the presence of his greatness? And it's not a bad feeling. It's, it's a wonderful feeling to know that I'm not that greatness and I can be part of that greatness. So uh, again, it's how you reframe the laws. And, I, you know, and the truth is we don't even have, you know, we, we, you know the, the code of Jewish law. There's no such thing as a code of Jewish law. There's a Shulchan Aruch. What kind of name is that for a book of laws? Shulchan Aruch, the set table. That's a that's a name of a book for recipes. Ah, it is recipes. They thought it was laws. It's not. It's recipes for kedusha, for shlemus, for wholeness. So if a person says, "Ah, it's hard for me to keep these laws," is it hard for you to follow the recipe? It's a recipe. So that's why I believe it's called the Shulchan Aruch because it's not laws. It's a recipe. Okay, there's a lot of love questions, Rabbi uh, Aaron. Here we go. Okay, you're on. Okay. Uh, thank you so much. This, this share is extremely powerful. I never heard these ideas before. Um, I wanted to ask, similar to the question before, just a little different, about the fact of growing up with uh, you know, the idea of a punishing God all the time. 
family school. That's just the way I was taught. And changing that is extremely difficult. My, my, my question is more like, when I know that pain has meaning, it really gives me power. It empowers me and it feels like, yeah, pain has meaning and it does something to me that gives me power. But right away, this message of like, mm, maybe it's your fault because, you know, you did this, that and the other, it, it grabs away all my power to, you know, to continue going and continue doing. So how do I actually get the job done of changing the messaging, doing it weekly and yes, hearing it all. But is that the only way of just continuing doing this for as long as the messaging changes? Right. By, by the way. Uh, are, are you I, I'm just getting your age because uh, you're in Hester Punning right now? Uh, you're uh, you're you're married. You have children. Yes, 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 I have quite a few kids. I'm married. Okay. Yes. So the first thing is just make sure that your kids don't get this. It might be difficult. You know, I want you to know that what I teach, I'm struggling with too, because I I have this stuff in me too. I have this also. You know. As I said, only the wounded rabbi can heal. I'm wounded from that God, that God that I want to save people from. I'm running from. I'm trying to deal with it too. And Baruch Hashem, my kids don't have this. I don't know if I'll ever be able to completely get rid of everything I'm teaching if I could really, really embrace everything I teach. But I, I also have baggage down there deep inside, even though my parents never said I'd be punished. I mean, they didn't talk to me. I'm just joking. They did. But uh, but I grew up with such a Holocaust, uh, you know, consciousness. So the first thing is make sure your kids don't don't let this get passed on to your kids. At least that my kids, Baruch Hashem, love Yiddishkeit, love Hashem. They're all passionate about Yiddishkeit. They're they're happy people. You know, they're Baruch Hashem. I, 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 I saved them from from God and I gave them Hashem. And so the first thing is, make sure your kids don't get this. I, I gave a, I, I gave a, a workshop on tefillah in Ramat Beit Shemesh. A woman gets up at the end of the class. She said, I'm from my whole life. And I hate davening. I hate davening. Whenever I open up a sitter, all I see is fear me, fear me, fear me. But I dove in because I'm afraid my children won't be from. I hate going to the Kotel. I can't stand being at the Kotel because when I'm at the Kotel, I hear only fear me, fear me, fear me. And But I, if I don't go to the Kotel, what kind of example is that to my children? They won't be from. So I said, she said, and, and, and honestly, I've never, ever heard anybody explain Tefillah the way you did. I, no, nobody ever explained Tefillah the way you did. I've, not, I've never heard such an idea. So I said, listen, you have to understand that, that this is not going to work for your kids to, to just simply pretend that you're davening. They're going to pick up on it. You know, somehow it's going to come out. You know, you got to deal with this. The Shem isn't about fear me, fear me, fear me. The really meaning of Yira, Yira Romamut, Yira Shemayim, there's Yira Onish. There's year at chet, year at you know consequences. I I don't say punishment. Consequences onish. Year at chet means the year of of failing, and then there's year at shemayim, which is year at ramamut, which is an adoration. It's an awe. It's it's being in a state of a a, a marvelous mind, a mind of marvel. And that's where, when we talk about a person who's a Yiri Shemayim, that's what we're talking about. As a person with adoration, when you're standing in front of the Grand Canyon, you say, wow, I can't even put this into words. I'm just, this is unbelievable. When my, my first daughter was born and I'm holding this baby and I turned to my wife and I said, only when life becomes unbelievable will Hashem become believable. And that's the problem. You, if you want to get to Hashem, you've got to walk through the world. You've got to look at your fingers and say, this is unbelievable. This is just unbelievable. That's when Hashem becomes believable. And, and there's a lot of self-talk that, that you need to do. And I don't know how, how, how much we can get rid of the wound. I don't know. Let's make sure our kids don't get them. You know, we don't want to, we don't want to give our kids our scars. 
and 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 mm-hmm. we and I still think I mean Baruch Hashem, I I am I'm a way ahead of myself than I was many many years ago, living in this constant fear of this angry deity mm-hmm. who's out to get me is not out to give me, mm-hmm. and just wants me to fear him, and it's all about him, you know he created the world. I had a student, and he told me that he wants to know why Hashem created the world. His Rebbe said, so we should worship him. I said, were you happy with that answer? He said, no. I said, well, did you tell him that? He said, no. I said, why not? I said, I didn't want to get into a fight. Well, did you at least ask another Rebbe? No, I know that they all talk this way. And I, 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 you know, it's all about glorifying him and worshiping him. You know? And so it sounds like Hashem is some actor, almighty actor, who said, let there be a theater. And there was. And he said, let there be an audience. And there was. And he said, thou shall clap or I shall kill you. Is that, this is terrible, terrible. People are thinking like this. They're not thinking, I'm obviously over-dramatizing it. But, but to, you know, there's a very deep concept, that Hashem created everything for his honor. It couldn't be what people think because a rodef kavod is a very bad mida. A person who pursues honor is not something that's admirable at all in Yiddishkeit. And yet now we're saying Hashem pursues honor? He created the world for his honor? What does kavod literally mean? And these are shiurim and we need to get to the... And it saddens me when people said, I never heard these ideas before. I didn't make this up. I've been researching this for decades already. You know, I didn't make it up. And um, we got a lot of work to do. And I'm, I'm happy that uh, we're doing some of it now. All right, Alan, the next thank you, SK. <laughs> I know, do you want to, you know, thank you so much for uh, your question. Okay, sorry. Yeah, hi, hi, Rabbi Aaron. By the way, I, I, reviewed, um, I, I reviewed one of your books for a library journal many years ago. We really like your, you know, we okay. really like your writings there. Um, I was... We were talking about the, the woman that was davening so her kids stay from. I mean, I was wondering to what extent, you know, that many of us feel we, we have to da- like, not just worry about our own connection with the shim and, you know, but like try to, I don't say get involved or worry about a relative, you know, a loved one, a friend who may not be, it's not just not be, may not be on a desired spiritual level, but they're going through a hard time. And you don't know to what extent to interfere or try to pray for them. I feel like right now, um, privately, I feel like I'm plea bargaining with Hashem for somebody who's going through a, a, a relative, a close relative. Right. What's well, so on my <laughs> website? I have a shear yeah. called, I think it's called Jews Don't Pray. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we 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 mit palel. We have to go back to the original understanding, you know, because the not Jewish understanding of prayer is begging. And this yeah. is not Yiddishkeit. Lit Palel is not what prayer is. And we need to get back to the basics. You know, the basics are the most profound, the most essential, and yet very often the most neglected in Yiddishkeit. And, I, and I'm meeting people that are, you know, are, are, are well-versed in Halacha and well-versed in Gomorrah and Tanakh. But what does the name Yud Kei Vav Kei actually mean? Mm-hmm. How is it different than the name Elohim? What does Lehit Palel actually mean? And mm-hmm. so um, when we have these understandings that are oppressive, then we have to have the courage to ask questions. And if we don't get an answer that we're happy with, then keep asking. Don't yeah. give up. A Yere Shemayim is a person that asks questions. I have a friend that grew up in a from home. And when he would ask questions about Hashem, his father would hit him. Where's your year at Shemayim? Out the window, dad, after you hit me. <laughs> I'm like, what do you want? Mm-hmm. You know, that's not going to give me year at Shemayim. And so um, a person with year at Shemayim knows that Hashem knows what he's doing. Hashem is godless. Hashem is greatness. And mm-hmm. I won't stop asking. And I'm not going to shrink Hashem into some puny being that just wants to punish me and hurt me and control me and uh, what 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 is this? Well, yeah, maybe there is a certain level of acceptance, but 
So don't accept yeah, no, the person has to be maybe responsible for his own actions, mistakes, but there is that desire to want to help, or you don't know, you know, so you don't not knowing what to do exactly. That's maybe asking a Shem for help. But, uh, you know, you should I should I or should I just worry about just worry about my you are Rahmana. Yeah. You are mm-hmm. unconditionally loving. Give me the love choice I need to make in this situation. Is the love mm-hmm. choice to leave them be because mm-hmm. maybe helping someone that I'm not able to help might hurt more if I'm mm-hmm. not capable of helping them if I'm the wrong person. I don't mm-hmm. know. It's the, the loving choice is 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 not an easy choice. No, no, it's going to be on my mind a lot. This, you know, I mean, it's been on my mind in L. I will be, you know, I I can't help it. I will be thinking about it over Rosh Hashanah. It's right. a, you know, it's a very solid, but yeah, maybe try to let go in certain areas, I suppose. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks for sharing. I, I, it's yeah. hard to answer when you don't know the details. So yeah, yeah, I can't. I'm not really asking you to share the details, especially. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay, Rabbi Aaron, let's go to the next live okay. question. You're on. Hi, Rabbi. It's uh, it's an honor to speak with you. Um, my question is this: the more I've integrated philosophical and kabbalistic understandings of Hashem and the nature of existence, I've begun to feel alienated from those that are content with the more surface level existence of the concrete and physical world. How do you relate and communicate with those that are not interested in your view of the world, practically speaking? Um, the more that I, the more that it sounds I, like yeah. you just wrote that. That's very, very articulate. <laughs> Thank you very Thank much. You. Um, but let me let me just break it down. Once you get to this this understanding, you feel alienated from people that don't have that understanding. Is that what you're saying? Correct. Yes. Because you brought something. You you mentioned something about physical, but I. I, I don't have problems with the physical world. Baruch wants to be in this physical world. So I, that part, I didn't really get how that fits in. Uh, all right. But, um, you know, first of all, Yiddishkeit is a very action-focused path. And, you know, I, maybe there are people, I'm sure there are people, that don't have this orientation to Hashem, but they're living a good life. You know, the truth is that I'm not sure the secret life of God is 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 good reading for everybody. There's some people that they're okay with how they understand Hashem, and their behavior is anyways aligned with Yiddishkeit in a beautiful way. So uh, you know, it's it you know, it's not for me if they think Hashem is someone somewhere over there. But they believe he loves them and he's on their side and and the, the negative side effects of Hashem being this distant being is not affecting them. Okay, the ikar is how are they behaving? Are they behaving in a loving way, in a patient way, in a responsible way, in a sensitive way? So I can relate to them, even though when I'm standing next to them, I'm not sure we're talking to the same God. But I don't have to be talking to the same God because we're living a path that manifests Hashem in our actions. And so um, so it's important also not to be judgmental. We, we, we don't know. We don't know. Uh, and also this timing in terms of when a person's ready for these kinds of understandings of Hashem. You know, a child should be taught that Hashem is a Venus Shabbat Shemai. That's the right thing to say to a kid. He's our father in heaven, and the child is going to think that Hashem is someone somewhere over there. There's a reason why we start them off that way. As time goes on, we have to fill in the blanks of what is Shemai and what is a Venus Shabbat Shemai really mean. But, um, but there's a journey and there's um and, and there's a timing to what can be shared and when it could be shared and how much. So if there are people that might not have the orientation to Hashem that you do, that's okay. As long as as long as they're they're living and their behavior is is pretty healthy. I, I identify with their behavior. Does that make mm. sense? It it does make sense. What you just said resonated with me um specifically that when you're talking to some people, you feel like you're, t- you're, you talk to a different God than them. That, that really resonated with me. Um, growing up, I felt like I was presented with, with a God that 
I didn't believe in as a kid. I was like, there's no way that this God exists. It just doesn't, not, nothing about it makes sense. He's cold, he's distant, uncaring. He exists outside of us. None of it checks out. Um, you know, so a lot of resentment built and I had to really uh, rehabilitate my relationship with Judaism and find God for myself. And I think uh, when you said like, um, not to be judgmental, that's something I struggle with because uh, for myself, it was, there was so much darkness there looking at that aspect of God. It's hard to just um, allow, you know, people to pass by like that and just say, oh, they're just, their actions are good when they, they seem to be perpetuating this, this God that is so backwards, so twisted and so not the actual reality. Yeah. Well, yeah. The question is how, you know, what position are they in to be influencing other people? You know, if they're an educator and, and the way they speak about Hashem then turns into uh, a, a language of threat, disempowerment, well, then it would be good if we had some way to converse with them. But we might not be able to, and I don't really know. So um, we start with ourselves and we start with those who are closest to us and that are ready to hear. But, you know, there's a, there's a teaching that you should say what people can hear and not say what people can't hear. If a person's in a place where they're not able to hear it, then it's not the time to share it. And as I mentioned before, uh, you know, sometimes I meet students and they're not ready to hear the kind of things I'm sharing. And, and, and if I share it with them, it's the wrong time. It's, it's not, it's not the right time for them. Um, so, uh, so that's why, you know, my, my, my job isn't to judge anybody. And uh, my job is to as much as I can and um, cut people some slack. And, you know, who knows, maybe, maybe that's what they need to believe right now. I don't know. Thank you. Yeah. Here, Baron, like two more live. Okay. Then we'll go to the closing segment. Uh, so people just want to ask. So many people really want to ask you. Okay, you're on. Okay, thank you so much. This is marvelous. Okay, so I understand that Hashem does everything for my benefit and Hashem loves me, right? I also know that when things are going rough, because even when Hashem loves me, he wants me to grow and he's going to do things that are rough for me and I don't understand why he's doing it to me. I'm also allowed to tell Hashem, Hashem, I've had enough and please leave me alone. <laughs> How are the two not a contradiction? Uh, it is a contradiction, <laughs> you know, but a completely understandable one. Um, look, if Hashem takes you to it, then Hashem will get you through it. And um, again, it, our, our, some of our biggest choices is what we're going to say to ourselves. You know, in the world of Sod, you've got what's called the sphere of Malchus, and Malchus is identified with Dibor, speech. It's also identified with Yira, and it's also identified with the Chira. And I think you put that together, and it's really about, I think, so much of our choices is what we choose to say, very much what we choose to say to ourselves, and then what we say to Hashem. And um, the question is, is that the best thing to say to Hashem, leave me alone, because I'm kind of hearing myself saying that you don't know what you're doing and I can't handle this, so leave me alone. I, I, I don't think it works. I think we need to really get down to, does this work? Uh, not just, is this right? Even before we get to this right, is this working for you? To say to Hashem, leave me alone, I can't handle this. Um, so I, 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 I don't know, you know, I, I mean, you know, as a rabbi, Rarely do people seek me out when life is going well. <laughs> I don't need to talk to rabbis when my life is going well. I go talk to rabbis when my life is going horrible. I need to talk to you. So I hear, you know, that's when you hear people. You know, people don't go to therapists to tell them my life is doing well. And so I've heard some really horror stories. And, uh, but I think the, I, I think the key to our, our, our cure is to speak a positive language of growth of opportunity, of hope, of patience, of self-compassion, and say, I know Hashem, you're on my side. I know you're on my side. And um, and and this, and you're not you're not hurting me you, to, to hurt me. Uh, this is some there's some kind of healing going on over here. 
and um, and I'm gonna try and really be patient with it. I know that's difficult. I'm not. I'm not saying it's not difficult. That's really where people have a hard time with the relationship. They're talking to Tashem. You know, they're they're connected, but if they see only negativity, they might need help to be able to see the full picture, to see positive in the situation. That um, seeing what's your connection with Hashem. If you only see negative, then you know you. You might need help to be able to see the full picture. Yeah, yeah. Look, uh, it, it's no accident that we wake up in the morning and we say moda ani, and the first word that should come out of our mouths is moda. As I mentioned, the Yehudi is someone who is mindful of and grateful to Hashem. And the more we focus on what we have, the more we're able to cope with what we feel we don't have. Uh, and that's hard. You know, my granddaughter said, Saba, you know, do you see, do you see the half a cup full or the half a cup empty? So I said, you first. She said, I see the whole cup full. I said, how could that be? It's full of water and air, Saba, you know? <laughs> so, you know, so if a 15-year-old can say that, that's pretty impressive. So, um, so we try, we try. Uh, it, 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 it's a journey, it's a challenge, it's a struggle, and we won't always get it right. But I think this is something that's come up before. Hashem gave you that Yetzirah. He knew what he was doing. He put you in this world. He knew what he was doing. And so people have to understand that they, they take all this blame on themselves. But Akarnas Barclay is saying, hey, listen, I, I, I'm, I'm with you. I gave you that Yitzhahara. So I'm going to take a little responsibility here too, you know? No se avon. He's going to carry our avonos with us. So when people just get so into this blame thing and shame thing, uh, Hashem must be completely disappointed in me. Hashem knew that this is not going to be easy. And anyways, he put a little piece of himself into this world, you know, called you. So he's with you. His mom is with you. Beautiful, beautiful. Okay, right, right, let's go to the last question. You're on. Yes, hi. Thank you so much. So my question is like this. I wanted to know, what what's the purpose of this whole world? Um, everyone always says, I mean, we know that the upper world is all good. It's all light. It's it's There's no pain. It's almost like, don't be born in the first place. Leave me up there where it's all good. I don't need that muscle power. We were good up there in the first place. What's the whole purpose of coming down, going through all that pain and suffering, and then going back there? Uh, how much time do we have? <laughs> it's too bad this is the last question. <laughs> According to my clock, we have one minute left. No, uh, unlimited time. What? Unlimited time. Oh, yeah, we're, we're in Ain Sof already. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah, look, um, okay, but this is not fair because I'm going to say something that's so unusual that most people are not familiar with. And, uh, sometimes it's like too much, too fast, but, but maybe whatever you get from it, you know, okay. Hashem, is a tovu muhlat. Hashem is the absolute good. That's Hashem is absolute good. Absolute good is what we call Hashem. Atov. The question is, what is the what is absolute good? Let's have two friends. One is good, was good, always will be good, cannot but be good. Is he good? He's a kind of a good robot. You know, he's good. But I have another friend who's got a Yetzahara, and he struggles with good. He has to make a choice with good. I have a friend who is kind, was kind, always will be kind, cannot but be kind. He's obsessively, compulsively kind. Is he kind? Yeah, but he's kind of a robot. But then you have my friend who's got a Yetzahara, and uh, he struggles with kindness. They both pick up the Torah. It says, Hachnas is Orchim is an important, being hospitable is an important mitzvah. My friend who is kind, was kind, always will be kind, cannot but be kind. He's always doing Hachnas is Orchim. He can't stop. Okay, that's great. But the other one, he's got a Yetzirah. 
and chooses to be kind, which one of my friends manifests a greater kind of kindness? The one who is kind was kind and cannot but be kind? Or the one that even though he has a Yetzirah challenging him in his kindness, he chooses to be kind. I think we all intuit that to choose good, that good is a rich kind of a goodness. A rich kind of a goodness. Now, Kodesh Baruch Hu is absolutely good. Is a Kodesh Baruch Hu missing the possibility of a goodness born of choice and struggle? Does he have to? He doesn't have to. I'm not saying he has to do this. He doesn't have to include a goodness born of choice, generated by choice. But is he free to? Is, he, is it possible that the absolute good is free to include the manifestation of a goodness born of choice? Yes. And guess who that is? You. You are, you know, when people say, what good are you? It's a good question. Every one of us is a little mm -hmm. piece of good that we came to choose. And Yetzirah is pointing to what you came to this world to do, to choose that good, to choose that good. So when you were in Shemayim, it was the good of the robot. It was good up there. I didn't have a Yetzirah. I wasn't in a world that was so provocative. Yeah, but Metavah Kaddish Baruch Hu said, Dere Yitoh B'Tach Dunim, Kaddish Baruch Hu wants to be in this world. Good wants to be in a world where goodness can be manifest as a choice, as a courageous choice. We have all come here to be heroes of the good, heroes of the love. It's a deep idea, and it's very different that people haven't heard. It's based on the teachings of the Arizal. Uh, and how do you get to experience that, though? Choose good. When you choose good, you know what? When people say, I don't feel like it, animals don't do what they feel like doing. That's an animal. I want to do what I feel like doing. Animals do what they feel like doing. But human beings can choose to do what they don't feel like doing. So you have a neighbor that's annoying and I don't feel like being nice to them. Beautiful. That's an opportunity to choose good, choose love. I don't feel like loving them going to choose to love. I don't feel like being calm. I'm going to choose to be calm. We're here to make choices. And then what? And then what do we gain from all that? To go back up there? And what, do we get anything greater you, from that? You awaken to the greatness of who you're a part of, which is your Olam Abba, Enod Milvado. You know, Olam Abba, experience that the Tzadikim are sitting and Nene Meziva Shechina. The tzaddikim are sitting and they're enjoying the radiance of the Shekhinah, the, the presence of Hashem. Most people think that means they're sitting there and there's a television that's radiating the Shekhinah. They're sitting in Nani Meziva Shekhinah that's radiating from their face, from their being. They're feeling the presence of Hashem permeating their, their entire being. They don't think they're God. They know they're not God. But they know there's nothing but God. And even though I'm not God, I'm one with him. So uh, that's, that's, that's where we're going. We're going to wholeness. We are becoming wholly, completely who we are. And who we are is a chelak elokam al that is in this world to choose good. Thank you. Okay. Let's go to the closing segment of tonight's program. Thank you for coming on. Really appreciate it. Tonight was like, I feel like going back to the olive base. So it's, it's so important. Um, Hopefully, come back more and we'll get deeper into it. Tonight's share is 202. Um, if anyone wants to join the WhatsApp communities, please WhatsApp me at 732 314 1710 and I'll send you the community link to sign up. You could also go to menachemburnfall.com and sign up for his weekly emails with all the speakers and the replays. Again, if anybody's here the first time every Sunday night at 9 30 on this Zoom ID, we have a different stream, different topics with different therapists, Rabbanim, motivational people. And next week, September 22nd, we're going to have. Amazing program with Rabbi Joey Rosenfeld, world famous Mashpia speaker from Eretz Yisrael, the Chaver from Eretz Yisrael, are coming here, coming back. And the, the topic is called The Possibility of Joy, Saying Yes to Life in Spite of Everything, Imagination, Dreaming, and the Power of Optimism. It should be a very powerful program. Rabbi Joey is very deep. He's been on many times. So please uh, join us. And um, everything is recorded on channelvimenachemberful.com. If anybody has any questions of Coach Menachem, you can email coachmenachem at gmail.com. Uh, tonight's share is 202. You can listen to it on the phone lines at 732-305-9011. If anybody would like to reach Rabbi David Aaron, 
Oh, uh, he has a website. I think it's RabbitDavidAaron.com. I went to look right before the show. It actually, was not working. So check on that. Um, you can go there and connect with him. And he has all his programs, Menachem and Shemmels. And his recap email will send out the website and all his books. And I guess all the Shior many programs he has, please add it to the email. Again, thank you to all the advertising sponsors, Lakewood Scoop, Elinaria of Python Central, and Chayel Kaufman from JCN. I'm going to give a little closing to Menachem, the Rabbi Aaron. I'd like you to wrap it up. I just want to say that it's Arab Rosh Hashanah and there's a lot of things happening in the world. And we feel that just discussing this, as much as it's so deep and so everything, at the end of the day, it's the fundamentals of Judaism and understanding what God is and our connection with God. So I think it's, we were making a joke out of it and calling it Aleph Beis, but it really is Aleph Beis. But we need to sometimes we go back to Aleph Beis. And, you know, we go sometimes so deep into so many other things. But we need to really always go back to what our connection is and how we connect to him and what how we view Hashem. Remember, Aaron, we had many Redim Shirim on Hashem and you know connection, and tonight's show was very powerful. So we really appreciate it. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass it over to Coach Menachem. Yeah, I want to thank you very much. Um, we've heard we heard a lot tonight, and I'm getting the messages, a lot of refreshing ideas. Many people, um, it's the first time they're hearing about it. And like we mentioned, you know, just hearing about it once, you know, doesn't always do the job. You have to, it's changing many, many years, and there's a lot of healing that needs to be done um, to be able to get those uh, programs, you know, to rewire and to change. And that's really what Hashem wants. All Hashem wants is you should really, really know him. And that's, you know, the fear that we have. It just doesn't let us have that connection. So we have to relearn. What is this? How do I, how am I going to reconnect and feel that love so that I can fear in a healthy way that I can be connected? And then when we go through challenges, it's not always easy to hear the program when you're going through a challenge. But eventually, with the grief and with letting things, um, letting yourself um, feel whatever you feel, whether it's anger, eventually you can back up and you know connect, connect with that Hashem, with the healthy one, with the healthy Hashem. And again, we should have this uh, program. You should have it on recording in the kitchen. Just keep on going again and again. Eventually, it's going to go in. It, it takes time, and there's a lot of healing that we need. If we have, if the first time you're hearing these ideas, then obviously there's so many years of other ideas, and it needs to change. Find somebody that you could talk to, whether it's a therapist, a good friend, and make it your mission because this is the foundation. So thank you, thank you very much. Hashem shall help us all heal. Amen. Hey, Rabbi Aaron, you've been on the program for two hours. Now, Dvar Mayitz Ben Alev, things that you feel. Yeah, well, first of all, oh, it all. good morning. It's, uh, <laughs> it's uh, sun rising right now. Uh, first of all, thank you so much. In Kala Kavad, this is really in Avodah Hashem. It's a big service what you're doing. Uh, it saddens me how many people have significant misconceptions about the Kaddish Baruch Hu and the basics. The Vilna Gaon says that the Sod is the Pshat. And my Rebbe said, so is connected to the attribute of Yisod, which is the attribute that ties it all together, pulls it all together. And he says, the Sod is pulling it all together. And I have a friend who's a therapist and he specializes in uh, eating disorders. And he told me something very sad, that there's a very high population of girls that are in seminary that have eating, dis that eating disorders. And he told me that his basic therapy with the girls is he gives them my book, The Secret Life of God, and they eat it. I'm just joking. They don't eat it. But uh, and I said, well, you give, why are you give them The Secret Life of God? And he said, because they have such unhealthy understandings of Hashem and of the goal of Yiddishkeit, and they feel that so much in their life is being controlled, controlled, controlled. They've got this unhealthy need to find something they control, which happens to be in a very unhealthy way in their, in their eating disorders. We need to understand that, that Amuna is the very foundation of health, mental health. And what we're saying to ourselves or what we're allowing others to say to us is, um, it, 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 it is, is the key to it all. 
is the key to it all. And so these ideas shouldn't be new to us. And, uh, and we should be asking the questions, who is Hashem? Who are we? Why is he interested in us? What does he want from us? And how can we live the best life we can? And, and that's Torah is an answer to the ultimate questions of life. And it is the key to wholeness. And we want to be whole. So I bless you all that you should be, you know, you should celebrate and find joy in this time of Elul. It's a difficult time for Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. And uh, we have to remember Hashem is, is Avinu Malkeinu. The king is our father. He's on our side. He's on our side. Thank you so much. And uh, um, check out my website, RabbiDavidAaron.com. I don't know why, why it's not working, but... Uh, but it should work, but I'm all over the social media, YouTube, whatever. You'll you'll find me. Thank you. Good, Rabbi Aaron. Thank you so much for coming yeah, on. Thank you for keeping me up. My pleasure. Yeah, um, see you. everybody on next week, September 22nd with Rabbi Joy Roosevelt. Looking forward. Have a great week. Take care. Shalom. Shalom.